It's my pleasure to introduce to you then um, Kelvin Bartholomew, and he will discuss with you the Heisman salt and support of coal and iron. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, and, and absorb at room temperature and then either purge or evacuate at room temperature, we would tend to remove the beta-1 state because it is reversibly absorbed. In fact, Christman says that at room temperature, uh, all of the hydrogen is reversibly absorbed and uh, absorbs with the stoichiometry of roughly uh, 0.9 to 1 monolayers. Uh, if you count both the beta-1 and beta-2 states <coughs> indicating then the stoichiometry of one hydrogen atom per nickel surface atom. I guess I went backwards that time. Let's try going forward. This uh, shows the hydrogen TPD spectrum for 10% nickel on silica, and as you can see, it is similar to the one uh, for the single crystal nickel, and then we see the overlapping beta 1 and beta 2 states. And this table summarizes the data for these two catalysts, the kinetic data from the TPD, uh, along with uh, other data for the single crystal surfaces. And the uh, first thing I'd like you to notice is that the heats of absorption or binding energies are, are pretty much the same for the three lowest index planes of nickel, suggesting that uh, the binding energy is independent of surface structure. Also notice that the binding energies obtained for the polycrystalline supported nickel on silica uh, are pretty much in the same ballpark as those for the single crystal data, and that the orders of reaction are about the same. The uh, absorption of hydrogen on nickel alumina, however, is much more complicated, uh, as indicated by these TPD data from our laboratory. Uh, notice that there are several, at least one, two, and uh, maybe three uh, uh, states of hydrogen absorption at fairly high temperatures. And uh, in the case of the absorption at room temperature, there is a, a peak here at 50 degrees and uh, then uh, the additional three peaks. This one is decreased as we go to higher absorption temperatures, whereas the, uh, what I would call the uh, gamma uh, one and gamma two states are actually increased with increasing absorption temperature, reaching a, a maximum of somewhere around 150 degrees centigrade. Now this is what we refer to as activated absorption. That is the amount of absorption or the area under the curve increases with increasing absorption temperature. And in fact the activation energy in this case for absorption is on the order of 10 kilojoules per mole or in other words significant. If we look now at a study by Raup and de Messing of alumina on nickel, which they uh, sputtered about ten, seven tenths of a monolayer of alumina on nickel surface, we find that there is also this uh, high temperature uh, gamma state out here between 400 and 500 degrees Kelvin. If one absorbs at 300 degrees Kelvin, However, it is not observed if one absorbs at 150 degrees Kelvin. Uh, again, indication that absorption in the gamma state or the high temperature state is activated. Now, the uh, absorption, uh, the, acti the, the, the observation of this uh, activated absorption in, uh, into, uh, uh, and also the fact that we get new states that are produced at higher temperature uh, is probably best explained uh, by the presence of alumina decorants on the uh, supported catalyst since we get the same kind of behavior for alumina on nickel. <coughs> now in the case of uh, uh, nickel titania, we also observe a splitting into a low temperature uh, gamma state, and I mean a beta state, and a high temperature gamma state, and the effect is even more pronounced in this catalyst reduced at 400 degrees centigrade. Furthermore, we find that uh, the 
there is a, a, a decrease in, a very significant decrease in the amount of hydrogen absorbed, uh, the intensity of both the beta and the gamma peaks as we increase the temperature of reduction from 400 degrees to 700 degrees. Now, the, uh, this particular effect of a decreased absorption intensity and also the, the splitting uh, into a low and high temperature uh, uh, states has, uh, is probably due to the presence of a TIOX species on the surface. Indeed, uh, in a study by Ralph and the Messick, uh, they show that if uh, one uh, sputtered uh, titanium onto the surface of a nickel film, that uh, with increasing titanium coverage up to about two thirds, the uh, TPD spectrum changed from that of the what you would expect for a uh, single crystal nickel with the typical beta one, beta two peaks, to uh, two high temperature states uh, in the range of 350 to 500 degrees Kelvin. In other words, uh, there there was a shift to uh, high temperature states. And furthermore, they did find that these high temperature states in the nickel, of the case of titanium nickel, were activated. Again, uh, the comparison of the supported nickel on titanium and the titanium on nickel uh, are, are very similar and uh, uh, show very similar results and suggest again that decoration by the support is responsible then for uh, the production of these new adsorption states. Now that uh, I would like to, to say that uh, this phenomenon that uh, we have been talking about now in the uh, nickel aluminum, nickel titanium systems, well, it's it's uh, uh, some of the data are summarized here. Uh, and let me point out that uh, in the case of the uh, both nickel aluminum and nickel titanium, that you get uh, lower and higher binding energies for the low and the high temperature states, then the value of 90 to 96 kilojoules per mole that we observed in the nickel silicon. And the observation of these different binding states has a profound effect on the adsorption properties, the stoichiometries of adsorption, and also on the uh, catalysis as well. These are data, uh, uh, TBD data for 10% cobalt <coughs> silica that were also obtained in our uh, laboratory and serve to show that we observe a similar phenomenon in the case of cobalt uh, uh, catalysts as well. Uh, in the case, uh, for example, of this 10% cobalt silica, when we absorb at room temperature, we observe a low temperature state around uh, 50 degrees centigrade and one up here at around 250 degrees centigrade. And we see that the smaller peak disappears at higher absorption temperatures, and the high temperature peak grows, reaching a maximum at an absorption temperature of 100 degrees centigrade. And we see that uh, we have very highly activated absorption. Now this behavior, this highly activated absorption, uh, is very typical of most cobalt catalysts, of unsupported cobalt and cobalt on <coughs> many different supports. In fact, on uh, cobalt CSN5, you do not see any hydrogen chem absorption at room temperature. You have to go to 100 or 150 degrees centigrade in order to get any absorption at all. Not only can the support cause changes in the kinetics and energetics of absorption, but also the method of preparation, pretreatment, and uh, presence of ad atoms such as promoters. And the next two slides illustrate the effects of pretreatment on the kinetics and energetics of absorption. And uh, what we see in this first slide uh, are TBD spectra from, for a 15% iron silica obtained in our laboratory. This particular catalyst was dried at a fairly low temperature, 60 to 80 degrees centigrade, prior to reduction. And what we see here is moderately uh, activated absorption. What I mean by that? is that we see uh, quite a bit of absorption at uh, room temperature. 
uh, and a decreasing amount of absorption or area under the curve as we go to higher absorption temperatures. However, if we happen to cool down in hydrogen from 450 to 25 degrees centigrade, we get roughly twice as much absorption as we did at room temperature, indicating that there is activated absorption, but in this case it is relatively moderate compared to the next catalyst, which is again a 15% iron on silica, prepared by the same method, except it was dried at 100 degrees centigrade prior to reduction. And in this particular case, we observe no hydrogen absorption at room temperature. In fact, only a small amount of absorption at 150 degrees centigrade, increasing as we go to uh, 200 and 250 degrees centigrade. And we see a very large envelope for absorption as a tool in hydrogen from 450 to 25 degrees centigrade. And it is this large envelope that would be indicative of the monolayer of chemisorbed hydrogen. Uh, maybe I should uh, be, uh, back up for a second and uh, explain what we think is responsible for this phenomenon. Notice that uh, we not only get a more highly activated absorption, but we see a shift in the uh, position of these states, these absorption states, to higher binding energies. And uh, we think there is, is a great deal of evidence that the uh, increasing activation energy, uh, and as, 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 as well as the uh, increasing binding energy, uh, are probably due to the presence of either uh, silica or iron oxide species present on the surface, and that the method of preparation affects the uh, coverage of those species on the surface. Now, in the case of 15% uh, iron on silica promoted with 3% potassium, we observe uh, even uh, greater effect in that uh, we see no absorption at all below 240 degrees centigrade, and we see an increasing uh, absorb amount absorbed up to 340 degrees centigrade. And there is a new uh, uh, a new peak that occurs out here at about 400 degrees centigrade, indi indicating a very strongly bound uh, hydrogen absorption species. And if we now cool in hydrogen from 450 to 25 degrees centigrade, we see that we get many more, uh, we get many fold uh, uh, times the amount of hydrogen absorbed. Now, in the case of this catalyst, we think that it is probably the influence of potassium species on the surface that perturb the electronic states of, of the metal surface and, and result in this highly activated adsorption. Let's talk now about uh, reversible chemisorption. From our previous discussion of the uh, temperature program desorption, we uh, indicated that there were low-lying atomic states of hydrogen uh, ones that occur at around 200 to 300 degrees Kelvin uh, and are uh, easily removed by uh, evacuation or purging uh, at below room temperature. In other words, uh, we have highly reversible uh, uh, chemisorbed atomic species in the case of hydrogen. And uh, this is further uh, uh, observed if we look at the isotherms for hydrogen, say, on nickel metal, and these are data from Richardson and Kale that uh, show that uh, as we go from uh, low pressures up to high pressures in the isotherm, we get a decreasing heat of absorption with increasing coverage and pressure, which is what we predicted from the temperature program, uh, program absorption data uh, as well. Now, there have been quite a number of studies of the nature of reversible absorption on supported cobalt, uh, iron, and nickel, and I've summarized some of the results here. Generally, they show that reversibility of hydrogen absorption uh, on these metals is influenced by the support, by metal crystallite size, uh, by preparation, and, and uh, uh, also 
by the addition of potassium. And that, that makes sense in view of, of the fact that we showed that the adsorption stage, uh, the temperature of, of a maximum for desorption, and the binding energies, uh, acti uh, the activation energies, all are a function of these same uh, parameters. Uh, for uh, one, one uh, fact here that's of interest, at room temperature in cobalt catalysts, the percent reversibility ranges from 15 to 90 percent, depending upon the metal loading, dispersion, and support. I can't get that. There we go. Now there have been a, another, uh, a number of phenomena proposed to explain reversible absorption on nickel. Uh, I believe that uh, most of the data can be explained by number one here, decreasing heats with increasing coverage based on the temperature program absorption and magnet magnetic data, which we showed you with lower binding energies in the range of 200 to 300 Kelvin. There are other phenomena uh, which are listed here uh, such as absorption on the support, spillover on uh, the support, reaction with absorbed contaminants such as oxygen, decoration of metal crystallites, uh, surface inaccessibility, multilayer absorption, and absorption into the bulk metal. Uh, of these, probably only the last, absorption into the bulk metal, can be eliminated entirely. But most of these other phenomena, other than the, the one we have been talking about, uh, are, are, pro are, are, are probably make a small contribution. For example, spillover is a very slow process and in a typical chemisorption experiment would not be important unless we had impurities in the system or we're using carbon supports. Just a word about adsorption stoichiometries and the measurement of monolayer adsorption. As you know, we rely on hydrogen chemisorption techniques, assuming that we have a monolayer of adsorption to measure surface area, to estimate dispersion, metal crystallite size in our catalyst systems. There is a great deal of evidence now that hydrogen adsorption on nickel, uh, cobalt, uh, and iron occurs with uh, stoichiometry. One hydrogen atom per uh, uh, surface metal atom if we choose the conditions carefully. And the next slide summarizes some of the principles that are important in obtaining monolayer adsorption on these base metals. The uh, first important principle is to reduce long enough and a high enough temperature to maximize the reduction of the oxides to the metal. Next, it's important uh, to minimize the time for evacuation to avoid contamination, uh, to equilibrate uh, long enough and at high enough of a partial pressure to ensure that equilibrium is obtained. And on cobalt, iron, and low loading nickel catalysts, it's important to absorb while cooling in a measured amount of hydrogen from about 20 degrees Kelvin below the reduction temperature in order to populate those highly activated sites. Uh, we find that measuring the isotherm by the desorption techniques gives us a, a more linear isotherm. We extrapolate that to a zero pressure in order to subtract out physical adsorption on the support and reversible adsorption that might contribute to a higher than monolayer coverage. And we use the total adsorption uptake rather than the irreversible adsorption uptake to determine monolayer capacity because as I showed you, the reversible amount of chemisorption could be as much as 90% of the total amount of adsorption. <coughs> now, if we're going to estimate crystallite size from hydrogen adsorption, we need to rely on some sort of model. And this is a model that was proposed by myself and Panel uh, for nickel on alumina. And uh, it involves three-dimensional spherical nickel crystallites on a, an aluminum support. The unreduced nickel, uh, we believe, is present as a thin layer on the support surface. And uh, the, this particular
particular model seems to be supported by experimental data that in the in the temp, uh, TEM data uh, in TEM micrographs of these catalysts, we do see three-dimensional spherical crystallites, uh, and ESCA and ISS data indicate that nickel oxide tends to interact very strongly with the alumina in the form of a surface aluminate uh, on, on the uh, alumina support. Now, I, I, I found, too, that many investigators go awry in their uh, estimation of nickel crystallite size by not taking into account the amount of unreduced nickel or cobalt or iron uh, in their samples. And, of course, we need to, to only, uh, only use the refraction, which is reduced to the metal in those calculations. Well, uh, I think my time is, is, is about up, and so uh, let's uh, summarize. First of all, uh, we showed that the kinetics and energetics of hydrogen adsorption on cobalt, iron, and nickel are a little affected by metal surface structure, but are very significantly affected by the support, uh, particularly in catalysts of low metal loading or those involving reducible support such as titanium. Second, the contamination of the metal surface by support moieties causes First, the appearance of new adsorption states of hydrogen at higher binding energies, and two, an increase in the adsorption activation energy for hydrogen, which can lead to severe kinetic limitations in the adsorption process, and by the way, affects the catalysis as well. And the, these phenomena here are responsible for many of the metal support interactions that we <coughs> talked about. Third, precalcination treatments and promoters such as potassium cause the appearance of new high temperature adsorption states and significantly increase the adsorption activation energy of hydro for hydrogen. Again, this affects not only the adsorption but also the catalytic and selectivity properties. Fourth, the hydrogen adsorption on cobalt, iron, and nickel is generally reversible at room temperature because of an atomic adsorption state which is easily desorbed at 200 to 300 degrees Kelvin. The reversibility varies from uh, 15 to as much as 90 percent and increases with increasing temperature, crystallite <coughs> size, metal content, and with decreasing extent of reduction. Five, hydrogen chemisorbs on uh, supported nickel catalysts of moderate loading at a room temperature and about uh, an equilibration pressure of up to 350 torr with a stoichiometry of one hydrogen atom per nickel surface atom based on total adsorption. Now this is also true of cobalt and iron if we cool down uh, in hydrogen from the reduction temperature. Uh, less than one layer adsorption is observed on cobalt, iron, and nickel catalysts of low metal content or supported on highly reducible supports. Uh, such as titania, suggesting contamination of the metal by these support species during preparation or reduction. And uh, I think that I will quit there and leave, I hope, a little bit of time for questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. Yes, please. Can you put on the lights, please? CSIRO Australia. In a real live Fisher Thompson cat reaction, of course, occurs in the presence of lots of water. And I was wondering whether you have done any of these kind of measurements with catalysts which have been exposed to water vapor. Yes. Um, in fact, we, uh, we did some studies with Ed, uh, Ed Schroeder, did some work where we looked at the inhibition of the methanation reaction with water. Uh, and uh, I think water can uh, serve to introduce oxygen onto the surface, and that will actually lower uh, uh, in, it will actually lower the number of uh, reduced metal sites on the surface. So it can lower the metal surface area. In the case of iron, uh, if you get into certain regions where you have high conversion uh, towards the end of your react re reaction and high partial pressures of water. You actually do form the iron oxide, so you would you would cut down on the number of metal sides. Uh, it's it's very clear nowadays that how the differently bound hydrogen affect the selectivity of a fissure torch reaction. But I do not know. Maybe you did some experiments or you know some information how 
the CO chem absorption itself is influenced by the differently bound hydrogen. Uh, let me say this, that uh, we, we know that hydrogen and CO uh, are somewhat competitive, uh, although it's not clear whether they absorb on the same sides, but the, there appears to be some competition. Uh, and uh, in the case of the iron silica catalyst that I showed you, uh, we found that in the catalysts that have been calcined, or the one that where we added potassium, uh, that due to those uh, high temperature hydrogen states, that the accessibility of the hydrogen to the catalyst was poor, and this resulted, resulted in, a, in a, a relatively hydrogen poor surface. It means that more car the carbon monoxide coverage was increased, and you tended to, uh, to get all of those or, or uh, hydrogen four products that were formed in that case. In fact, on one of our catalysts, we had uh, uh, almost pure olefins. The, the, the hydro, I mean, the, we had a, an olefin to paraffin ratio of around 400. So in fact, this is a, a coverage effect. I, I, think, I think that that is, is uh, one effect. I'm sure there are other considerations too. Last question. Yes, John McCray has arrived. Cal, I, uh, in support of Catalyst, I think I've asked you this question years ago, I'm not sure. Try that. Uh, I may have. Uh, on support of Catalyst, uh, this is uh, along with Al Sexton's question, uh, they have an infinite capacity nearly, or not infinite, but at least a very large capacity to absorb all sorts of states of water vapor. And I just wonder uh, why. <coughs> Why is it that when you reduce, say, a complex of metal on a support that requires activated reduction, and in your case, uh, you seem to suggest also activated absorption, why is that binding strength so high? Could not part of the explanation be that you were in fact involved in the production and mobility of water vapor, uh, both during the absorption and desorption phases, but you're focusing primarily on uh, just the hydrogen, which, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, how that would account for what we're seeing there. You don't see the water vapor, it's so strong the down on support. Right. You still could be producing it during your absorption and desorption processes. What you see if you're reoxidizing this uh, hard to reduce uh, aluminate type of complex uh, is only the hydrogen that results from uh, an oxidation by water. You never see the water because it's always so strong the down on the catalyst. Is that a, is that a fair kind of uh, question? To well, yeah, it's fair. Let's uh, let's try it out. Uh, I'm not sure how to, to answer for sure, but let, let me say this: in, in our, our TPD studies, uh, we're aware that, uh, and in our hydrogen uh, chem absorption studies, we are aware that it's possible to oxidize the catalyst. If you evacuate, for example, or desorb at a temperature higher than you initially reduced, that is a fact because, like you say, water is there. And so we were always careful in our TPD experiments, and we recommend also in absorption experiments, static absorption or flow, that you evacuate or purge at temperatures lower than you reduce. And so we've always avoided it. So I'm not sure that we can. Uh, I think you do, uh, because I, I think that when, when you have uh, reduced, let's say, 500 degrees centigrade, that you've desorbed most of the water that's going to come off, come off at 500 degrees centigrade and lower temperatures. Yeah, but you have to be sure that your absorption uh, treatment with the hydrogen does not uh, also repopulate again. Some of the oxygen that may move around is a you're talking about reaction of, of hydrogen with some oxygen to form water. Uh, and uh, we think that's a small effect if the catalyst is well reduced. But it could be a, a, an important effect if it's poorly reduced. So that's good. Thank you, Frank. I think we should move on. It's a pleasure now to introduce to you Dr. Watanabe, State of Service Hydrogen and Medicine.